What's up, guys, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Neo Vintage Podcast. I'm Jabral, and I'm with Steve. Hope everyone's doing well. And for you guys who have never seen the show before, we're just two guys that like to talk over the biggest stories in gaming. And we're back into the flow. We're, we're done with the next gen launch stuff, and now we're finally into the next gen. And we always like to start with what we've been playing. And I know this is going to be a super long segment because I'm sure we've been both playing a ton of stuff. So, Steve, what you been playing? So, yeah, all, I, all I've been playing, obviously, is on uh, the next gen hardware. Yeah. On, on Xbox, on Xbox series, uh, I've been playing mainly just Valhalla. I haven't put the time I want to in Valhalla. I'm still under 10 hours. Okay. But, you know, I, I, I do enjoy it when I'm playing. It's just there's so much out there. Uh, that there was all these other things I wanted to knock out first. And, you know, I do have Watch Dogs uh, Legions there, but I have not played it. I did install it and stuff like that. You hooked me up with that good deal. So, uh, snag that, boy. So, that's there, too. Just haven't been able to touch it. You know, and every night, usually before bed, me and my wife will usually play some Tetris Effect connected on there, which is great. We do the one where you go against the boss um, and stuff like that. So, it's pretty interesting. Nice kind of there. I love how fast it loads because usually it's just there. Yeah. So, I got to give huge props to that. Um, most of my time has been on the PlayStation just because I've been playing smaller titles there. So, I beat Miles Morales. Fantastic. Fantastic Absolutely. game. I can, I just love, adore that game so much. So I'm still going in there, um, getting the trophies, doing all that kind of stuff. I uh, completed Astrobot Playroom. Um, got all the trophies, got the platinum, my first PS5 platinum. It's uh, it's not that hard to do, actually, especially with the game help that's in it that shows you where, like, Everything missing is. puzzle pieces and stuff like that. Then there's you still have to look up a guide because um, there's, like, some random ones you got to know, which are, like, some PlayStation Easter eggs, like, hiding under a certain thing during a raining section to get a heavy rain themed trophy and stuff like oh, that but okay so, some nice ones and it's like this one where you have to like twist a certain amount of times and like the trophy's called twisted metal and little they were fun they were fun knocked it out really quick so got them there you know besides that i i've lightly touched uh call of duty black ops cold war i did get that as well I really only played zombies a few times and like one or two missions in the campaign i guess i have more uh, opinions next time we record and then besides that, just some other little things. Um, last night I did start off Sackboy, A Big Adventure. Ooh. And let me tell you, I can completely co-sign the purchase of this game. Oh, this nice. game is on the verge of out nintendo and Nintendo. Oh, wow. And um, in the terms of collectible, in the terms of style, in the terms of song, all the charm that Little Big Planet had, you know, the themes, the music, the way it's all kind of crafted and felt you know and stickers and stuff like that works so well when it's kind of just like a full game where it's not this create your own fun it's like no here's this really cool fun stuff here's there's some even some licensed uh cover songs i didn't even know that was in there um and it really reminds me of like the rayman legends like you know those song themed levels yeah when you're, so there's somewhat similar to that in uh uh, the big plan in uh, Sackboy, so it's it's great to see Sackboy finally stand on his own, not connected to this tool of a game, and it's like a full fledged game. And I can't wait to just keep jumping in. There's so many just like little collectibles and stuff like that. I'm gonna try to play it multiplayer today uh, with my wife. So that's really all I've been really playing. I, I it's kind of a lot, you know. In addition to a few somewhat backwards compatible things, I've been playing uh, Mortal Kombat 11, and the, I got the free upgrade to the ultimate edition which is the ps5 like official version and i mean that the load times are like not e even existent it's it's like i choose my character and then the next thing i know it's like fight and they're just started so nice to see these little upgrades i didn't buy the new pack yet so i don't have rambo um and all that kind of stuff but i've been having a great time with next gen it's everything i wanted super fast you know the games look fantastic and i just can't wait to keep testing things out to see what really flows so what have you been up to yeah, whew. and we have a lot of overlap for sure in what mm -hmm. we've been playing. Uh, I guess I could start with the Series X. I've uh, been playing mostly Valhalla. I hit 30 hours yesterday, so I'm, Oof, I'm like really nice. cranking through this game. Yeah, uh, It's really, really, really good. I like it. Um, I don't know if it's going to pass like Odyssey in terms of how much I like it quite yet. Uh, but I, I like the way it's structured and the way that you're kind of expanding through the map by forging alliances with different uh, societies, I guess. And uh, you can call on them later in the game as allies and stuff like that. So it, it's really kind of cool interconnected world that we're kind of doing here. Um, 
the oh, my I guess my main critique is now 30 hours into the game. I've seen a good amount of the map, not all of it, but a fair chunk of it, and a lot of it gets really samey after a while. Um, there's a little less kind of like geographical diversity, I think, in this game than what you saw even in Origins, but especially Odyssey. Uh, Odyssey with these different kind of the, that Mediterranean region just is so diverse to begin with, and then on top of that, you have all these different islands and sections and. Athens and Sparta, and they each have their distinct uh, aesthetic and stuff like that. Where on on this in England, everything kind of looks very medieval England. Mm. No matter where you're where where you are, Essex looks the same as Wessex, which looks the same as London, which looks like they all kind of look the same. And the, what differentiates itself, I suppose, is more the storylines that go in between them and um, whoever's in charge. So some places are a lot more wealthy and better off some places are built on the ruins of like roman societies some other places are built like you know super run down crappy gutter places so that's where some of the diversity of regions come from but that's like my main critique is just exploring this can get very very samey but they added a whole bunch of things that the previous games didn't have that really kind of diversify the game in that regard so uh, really like in Valhalla, I'll have more to say as I get deeper and deeper into the story. I don't really have a projection of where I am in the story. Um, of the five worlds, I believe I've been to four. Yeah, I've been to four so far. Yeah. Um, three of them are in the story, and this is not really a spoiler because you figure out this pretty fast. Three of them are actually like regions in the story, and two of them are like more kind of like supplementary content. Like, for example, in Odyssey, when you'd fight like Medusa, that's not actually in the canon story. That's something you could do kind of on the side there. And they have ways they to Assassin's Creed that and explain that. Um, and Valhalla has a very similar mechanic where it does play around with some of the Norse gods and, and stuff like that in a very literal you get to play as them type situation. Um, but those there's two worlds kind of linked to that, too. So it's not like you have five regions to explore in the canon story so much as there's like three and I understand there's like two linked to the kind of like dream state mm -hmm. content mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I won't go deeper than that because it'll get into spoiler territory. Right. Um, the second game I've been playing is Watch Dogs Legion. I went, I'm probably like three hours into it maybe. So not super deep. Uh, I would say I like it, but I don't love it. Um... Watch Dogs has always been kind of like some, a little off for me where I've always like saw what I like about these games but it's never quite hit 100% and the closest they got was Watch Dogs 2 uh, in San Francisco and stuff like that and I was like you know there's there's something about this that's connecting with me a little bit more but Legion in terms of tone has connected to me the exact same way the first one did which is just mm -hmm. that dark edgy hacker thing is just not really my thing at all. And uh, the best thing I think about Legion for me is just the fact that it's taking place in such a beautifully realized London. Uh, and again, just playing in other cities and stuff like that is really, really cool. And I enjoy the kind of recruit mechanism. There's, there's a lot of cool stuff about this game. But generally speaking, it's definitely like a secondary game for me. I don't see me playing this as like a main title at all. Um, it, it's also probably the least optimized next-gen game I've played. Uh, I've played, at this point, multiple next-gen games, and it's the one that probably runs the poorest. Uh, it doesn't run bad, but is it, it's the first one where I've seen kind of like drop frames, I've seen some weird textures, and uh, it feels very much like a last-gen experience, which I can't necessarily say the same for a lot of the PS5 and uh, Series X games I've played so far. But uh, generally speaking, the fact that we, me and you got it on a budget price makes it more than worth it for me, uh, and it makes it kind of like an excellent kind of B game to play when I get tired of playing, you know, Miles or, or Valhalla and I want something, you know, a little bit of palate cleanser, that's a good game to kind of just screw around the world, do a little bit of stealth and uh, recruit some new people. Uh, then on to PS5, I beat Miles 2. Obviously, I gushed about that the first show, mm -hmm. so I don't have to go deeper than that. Um, then I moved on to DMC5, the special edition. There we go. That, yeah. Wow, that game is excellent. That was excellent. Game of the year. Excellent game, excellent. To me, personally, and again, this is, I guess, a layman's opinion, because I've played all the DMC games, but I've only beat 1, 3, and the DMC game. Uh, but I've played them all, and I'm pretty familiar with them all. This one, for me, is one of my favorites. 
Uh, three from like a plot perspective, obviously everybody loves three. But man, this game is like polished. Like holy crap, not a single thing out of place, especially in the special edition. Now, mind you, I this is my first time playing DMC5. I didn't play the base game. So I'm going straight into like the highest quality version of dmc5 but holy crap first off uh visually this game is probably the best looking next gen game i've played so far i think this game does look better than miles in many ways um and then that's just crazy like just looking at v's face i'm like that, whole, like holy RE crap engine. and if i'm not wrong that's interrupt that's built on the re engine correct? yeah you know 100 percent. and uh I, that, that makes me really excited to see what resident evil looks like yeah. um but, like, I'm just playing this thing, and I'm like, holy crap, nothing. No frame drops, no weird wonky textures, just everything runs flawlessly. The load times are almost non-existent. I mean, they're, I didn't wait more than five seconds ever for a load time. Um, all these extra modes, there's just so much quality content on there. And I think it's only 40 bucks or something like that, too. Mm-hmm. So, if, if you guys have not played this game, jump into this, absolutely. There's really sliding difficulty options, so... And this is one of those games that I actually enjoy, kind of cranking up the the difficulty. And, um, I'm not good at this game at all, but just kind of the hectic nature of it, and the molten, like many, many different ways you can actually play this game is just so awesome. And for some reason, I took a real liking to playing as V, that kind of weird, passive having them do the distance and you up close thing it's so weird but i like doing it because it just feels like nothing i've ever played in dmc before and yeah just and again um well okay so we know virgil is added to the game now in the special edition that's not a spoiler he's Um, he's on the cover (laughs) yeah he's on the cover now so his integration is really really awesome and just playing through this game for the first time i'm just like this is phenomenal and i it was almost like the hades situation where i'm playing through this and i'm like I'm mad I didn't jump into this sooner, mm-hmm. but I am glad that I was able to jump on to the special edition, because chances are if I played it last gen, maybe I wouldn't have jumped into this. Uh, but man, this is this game is perfection. If you're looking for a next gen experience that takes advantage of really what this console can do, and have an excellent point of comparison with the last gen edition, I think this game is absolutely something you need to jump into. And I know you love this game. Yeah, so I played the base uh, version on release and stuff like that, and I loved it absolutely. I mean, I praise that game to everybody I talked to about it. Like, I was actually working at GameStop at the time, and I told I sold that game like it was my job. Um, and it was it's just such a fantastic game. Now I I, I will be downloading it today on uh, PlayStation um, Five to see the real differences and stuff like that. Cause uh, I've been wanting to go back to this game obviously for a while, um, but I was always like, ah, oh, they'll release DLC, and I was like, they'll probably put Virgil in it. Now they did it this way. That's fine. You know, I don't mind it, and I just can't wait to see the difference because obviously the previous gen was locked to you know certain frames, certain aesthetics, and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I heard specifically on PlayStation, it's out edges the P- Xbox uh, series a little bit, um, and that's what's kind of always been the case with Capcom. Uh, they okay. just sort of work better with PlayStation. I don't know if it's just that they gave them the hardware earlier or whatever it is. It's always just slightly more maximized on PlayStation consoles. So I'm excited to get into that today. Yeah, I couldn't recommend it enough. Uh, and then the last thing I played was after I beat DMC5 yesterday, because I've been running through these games surprisingly fast. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not a guy who's able to bench things very well, but I've ran through Miles and I've ran through DMC. Now I'm uh, playing Call of Duty. I played maybe five or six missions last night, so I get a good semblance of what it is. I mean, it, it's a Call of Duty campaign. I love Call of Duty campaign, so I'm having a great time with it. But am I going to say like it's reinventing the wheel? Not necessarily. Uh, I think the, the DualSense does some really awesome things with the way the guns feel uh, that I'm really, really enjoying. The game is beautiful. But beyond that, I mean, it is a Call of Duty campaign, and I haven't been able to play the other modes. So I can't speak on uh, multiplayer, Warzone, or Zombies. But uh, so far from what I've been able to play on the campaign, it's been really awesome. And I, I was dying laughing when they showed Reagan. I was like, what is Reagan doing in this game? Oh, when he comes out right at the beginning, he opens the door. Yeah, what is Reagan doing in this game? How'd you guys clear this? I, I don't know how they were great, able to. He looks great, though. He looks he great, though. No, his it hair, looks spot on. His hair, I was like, whoa, wow. Oh, it's just, okay. I'm watching this, and I'm like, how did you get this cleared? Like, I've never seen anything like this. Like, there's one thing to have, like, Kevin Spacey in it. Like, okay, you deal with a living actor who was able to sign on and get a guy. Like, how do you deal with, like, an 
ex-president that has since passed on. I don't know how you guys pulled this off, but it, um, it reminds wasn't... me of Black Ops One with Kennedy. That yeah, he's in there, and I was just like, "What's going on?" It, it, it's weird, but I love it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the game's awesome. Uh, I was able to get it as a gift, so I didn't have to front that seventy bucks for somebody who's only going to play the campaign like me. Is it worth the seventy bucks? I mean, I'm assuming no, but yeah. uh, that yeah. I mean, that's kind of the case with Call of Duty in general. Yeah, I got I got to be honest. So I picked when I was trying to pick up a pre-order at GameStop, they really messed something up. So they gave me like a forty dollar coupon. Okay. Plus like eighteen dollars I had in credit, so I was able to get Call of Duty very I didn't pay seventy dollars for it. Yeah, me neither. I have not touched. Remember, so Warzone is the exact same Warzone that's free to play right now. The okay. multiplayer, I don't really touch. I, I jump in every once in a while. People are having huge issues with that. I don't know. I don't know the breakdown. Um, Zombies is a little bit of a letdown because it's literally just one map. Black Ops Four launched with three maps, so it's kind of like all right. You're kind of. I, it's it's a hit and miss because they're like trying to say like the DLC and maps are gonna be free, but how long are we gonna have to wait? Some, some bugs, so I, I it's hard to suggest. Yeah, to go spend seventy dollars on this um, Call of Duty game when really I'm gonna play Zombies and the campaign. In, in the campaign, I'll probably play what once and that's it. And yeah. we'll see we'll see how the package uh, sweetens or sours. Yeah, for someone who's like super into Call of Duty and will take full advantage of the entire suite of content and, you know, they, you play the campaign, you play the multiplayer, you're really into the zombies and you, you know, hop onto Warzone on the weekends, for example, then yeah, I think you can more than justify the $70 cost. Uh, but it's entirely come down to like, what mode are you going to play and how much play are you really going to get out of that? So if you're if one of the few minorities like us that only plays the campaign, wait for it because Call of Duty prices don't really hold that much. I would say, you know, wait six months and you'll be paying at most 30 bucks for this easy um because again call of duty prices go really down well they go down physically then digitally yeah you, you want to buy freaking call of duty ghost you have to crack yeah. out 60 but um and but black on friday, sales they'll go black friday is right around the corner and they always release close to black friday and still go on sale so yeah i say wait on it if, yeah. if, you, if you're not super insistent on being there day one yeah wait on it and you'll you'll be able to save a lot more money Okay, so I guess we could jump into the stories then from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first story, Sony teases a PlayStation response to Xbox Game Pass. Now, obviously, Game Pass has been one of the better price propositions, player-friendly things that Microsoft has offered and that the game industry has frankly seen in quite a while. And everybody's you know question from there is like, Sony, what are you going to do about that? Because PlayStation now really ain't it. And uh, for some people can stream games and, you know, for them, brilliant, but a lot of people can't and you can't really download PS3 games and it, there's a lot of limitations to it. So a lot of people have been wondering, like, Sony, are you going to have a formal response to Xbox Game Pass? So in a TASS interview, I don't know what that was saying for, to be honest, uh, when asked directly on what Sony might have planned in order to compete with Xbox Game Pass, Sony Interactive CEO Jim Ryan stated that there is news to come. Uh, Ryan also emphasized that the company will not be emulating certain parts of Xbox Game Pass's strategy in particular. Ryan disagrees with Microsoft's tactic of releasing new games as soon as they come out on the subscription service. Uh, we are not going to go down that road of putting re releases, titles in a uh, subscription model. These games cost millions of dollars, well over $100 million to develop. We don't see that as sustainable, he commented. Now, some people took uh, issue with this. To be honest, I don't know how Microsoft is affording to do that like putting infinite on game pass day one i don't know to be honest so i don't necessarily blame sony for being like we don't see that as sustainable because i have no clue how microsoft is making that sustainable but i mean i guess they are they seem to be doing really well um but yeah i think this is something that needed to happen they need they don't necessarily need to scrap playstation now they can always have that as an option but uh they needed a revamped version to really allow people to have a suite of games for a fixed amount of money available to them to really you know have a great price proposition to, to compete with game pass because again sony has the exclusives they have excellent hardware they have excellent relationships with and stuff like that especially with like the japanese dev developers and stuff like that but there's some ways that on software end that uh, Microsoft's able to edge them out like that in terms of services. And I, I've always said that, hey, if Sony's able to compete on the service front, man, they're, they're going to have a real era of domination on their hands. And uh, I, I think it was just a matter of time until they found some way to counteract it. And hopefully, um, 
you know, something like that little PlayStation Plus collection when they launched the PS5 is an indication of, like, types of games that they'll be able to offer on a streaming service. I think that would be really, really awesome. So, uh, what were your thoughts about this? Yeah, you know, it's exciting. I was surprised that they even mentioned it because I always kind of thought the PlayStation Plus collection was the sort of semi-answer, like the half-step. And, uh, yeah. And it really it's kind of is, but, I mean, there's some fantastic games on there. There's God of War and some really fantastic games on there. But you can kind of see some of that early partnership already because I think Resident Evil 7, Biohazard is on there. So it's like, ooh, you know, what games are going to be able to put on this hypothetical PlayStation Pass or whatever they end up calling it or the new PlayStation Now if they combine PlayStation Now with the PlayStation Plus collection. We'll see what they end up calling it. But I think it's exciting mainly for that, for, for those third-party relationships and for those older first-party I think they're smart to stay with the we're not releasing Spider-Man 2 is not going to be day one on this pass because it doesn't make sense, um, especially when you're playing for a, a license like that. Yeah. And we see this with, you know, with the numbers. Xbox does not talk about the numbers of games they sell because they can't, you know. Sony was coming out, you know, we hit 10 million, we hit 15 million, 20 million know copies of spider-man was sold or whatever when their games sell huge amounts of numbers they they post it they talk about it they celebrate it and brag a little bit you know xbox said nothing about gears of war 5 when gears 5 came out they said nothing because it was available day one on game pass it was actually available like two days early on game pass because it just oh. launched so it was weird if you pre-ordered the game you couldn't get it but if you got it on game pass you got it two days early it's like weird nonsense that really shouldn't have uh, been the case you know but it's what's it going to look like when you start launching these other games like uh, you're going to start talking about number wise like oh this many people are playing it but it's, so it's, it's just confusing so that's why I'm, I'm glad Sony's still accepting and like hey we got to make an answer to this a true answer to this revamp something but we have to stick to our guns with what people want our IP and our games are you know, million dollar sinks to make. We can't just give this game away for free for fifteen dollars a month or whatever it ends up being. So it's yeah. it's smart, and I yeah. think it's the right way to do it. And I think it's also worth considering uh, considering that Microsoft and Sony specifically are very different companies in terms of their structure and their like you know how well they're doing to be honest. And I think it's not a crazy thing to say that Sony as a company is way more reliant on the PlayStation success and ability to monetize and generate a lot of income way higher than Microsoft is reliant on Xbox specifically. And so I feel like in many ways, Microsoft can probably operate a little bit more on a loss in terms of some of the money generated from their IP, as opposed to what Sony's able to do with PlayStation. Where again, PlayStation tanks, Sony's in trouble. The TVs ain't gonna cut it. But Xbox takes a couple losses for, you know, a couple different major games and stuff like that. That's okay because Microsoft has a million different products completely outside of the Xbox ecosystem to be able to generate money from. So I, I would imagine sometimes the parent company gives them a certain amount of leeway to be able to operate in this way and stuff like that. And uh, again, Xbox also could have that kind of Amazon approach where Amazon for a long time was operating on a loss because they knew at some point their install base would be large enough to generate more money than God at that point. So, and, and now Amazon is just beyond rich. Uh, but again, for a long time, for I mean, up until relatively recently, Amazon wasn't making a ton of money. And then th it just has to cross this threshold. And then, and it's, it's a way, it's a business model that's very risky, but it, it can have incredible, you know, rewards. And it seems like, who knows, maybe Xbox is going for that approach where it's like, be the most player friendly, have the best services, Operate a little bit on a loss in terms of money generated on the games. You get enough people in your ecosystem to the point that your hardware and your software sales, just the engagement levels are so high that that will justify the cost. And uh, I would imagine that's closer to what their business model is. But uh, only time will tell ultimately whether that'll work. Yeah, and we'll see how it works out for, for both companies. For sure. All right, keeping in uh, touch with Xbox. Here's continuing this confusing saga that is the purchase of Zenimax and the Bethesda family. So Microsoft wants Bethesda games first or better or best on Xbox. 
Um, so, uh, sorry, it's just, it's just hilarious. What me. does that mean? So, recently it was announced that Microsoft would be acquiring Bethesda. Immediately, everyone was wondering what this meant for as far as exclusivity goes. We are starting to get a little more information, finally. Now, since this announcement, we've gotten people from Bethesda coming out saying, no, it won't be exclusive. Then you got Phil Spencer being weird and mysterious. I don't know what he's kind of going on but now we have the xbox you know chief financial officer tim stewart who spoke out at the jeffrey's interactive entertainment virtual conference and uh, he gave more details so his quote was uh what we'll do in the long run is we don't have intentions of just pulling all of bethesda content out of sony or nintendo or otherwise but what we want is but what we want is we want that content in the long run to be either first or better or best or pick your differentiated experience on our platforms we all want Bethesda content to show up the best as on our platform so he again tried to clear it up afterwards where he wasn't saying that the games aren't going to be exclusives because I guess someone uh, pulled his ear and yelled at him a little bit but uh, they're going to continue to see that shift on wanting Bethesda content f first best or better on on Xbox and it's, this is just such a weird thing, and, it, and it's time. You guys have an, they've answered the question pretty much, um, between everyone kind of speaking out of turn that Bethesda games are coming to PlayStation Five. I don't see how anyone is reading it any other way. I think if it because if this was Sony who had purchased Bethesda, they would have come out quickly and said, "Welcome to the first party family," and then that would have pretty much confirmed the, the exclusivity. So what did you think of this? Because I know we talked lightly about it before because this is such a weird nonsense. That they're... I don't know why they don't want to just come out and say it. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's investor time. I don't know. They're obviously it's not worried about the deal not hitting exactly yet because everyone at every conference is <laughs> talking about it, you know? So what, what did you think of this whole situation now? Yeah, I mean, I think their messaging has been pretty terrible. Um I get the sense of when I read a lot of these statements, especially with, you know, Tim Stewart and I guess Phil Spencer and stuff like that, that they're kind of just talking to two people and naturally there's going to be some kind of dissonance there where you have to si simultaneously appease investors and the financial analysts and stuff like that and make them be like, hey, this is going to have great returns for us. Uh, but at the same time, communicate to the audience in a way that's not lying and they're kind of existing in this weird middle zone where... Yeah, the, we all know that, specifically some of the major Bethesda Game Studios games, like the next Elder Scrolls, the next Fallout, and stuff like that, will be on PS5. No, There's no doubt about that. Uh, would I be so, But I'm sure there are going to be some Bethesda games that are probably Xbox exclusives, at least temporarily. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if like the next Wolfenstein, for example, is like a timed exclusive on Xbox. Something that is not going to, you know... It's going to drive enough people to your ecosystem to justify making an exclusive, but it's not going to piss off so many people that it's looked at as player unfriendly in the way that, you know, Xbox has been so fervent on keeping away from. So, again, stuff like Wolfenstein is kind of what I envision as maybe the direction of what could be um, a more of an exclusive, but the next Doom, stuff like that, like, it, that's going to be everywhere. And Xbox knows that, and Phil Spencer has kind of alluded to that, but at the same time, I think they're they're trying to maintain some kind of marketing upper hand where, you know, like, for for example, Cyberpunk's going to be on everything, but they obviously have some kind of marketing deal with uh, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And if you look on their social medias, and it's, it's just marketing stuff where they kind of want to create the optics of, even though this is going to be everywhere, you should play it on here. Why? I mean, sometimes it'll be, uh, <laughs> the experience will be best here. It's not. But but because we want you to. So I think they're trying to occupy the zone where it's like, yeah, we're not going to pull it off at everything, but, like, you should play it here. Oh, is it only going to be on there? Well, no, but we want you to play it here. And it's just, it's. I think it's just marketing, to be honest. I think they just want to be in this zone where Bethesda games are everywhere, but Bethesda is synonymous with Microsoft, with Xbox. And this is the ecosystem we want you to play it in. Uh, but ultimately, I mean... If, if somebody played every single Elder Scrolls game on, you know, PC and then they moved to PlayStation with it or something like that, I, I don't think your marketing push is going to necessarily make them jump to the, e the Xbox ecosystem, you know what I mean? Unless there's a real major, like, DLC is different, timed exclusive, and maybe it performs way better on Microsoft. I, I don't know if the marketing is really going to amount to anything. 
Yeah, I, and that's what I always... I mean, that's what I read about it before I really got into the quotes and stuff. Is I'm like, well, you we're going to get time exclusivity, you know, exclusive content. And it's, it's stuff we've seen before, you know. That's, you know, back in the 360 days, you know, Microsoft used to get on Xbox 360 you a month prior to... You know, they'd be a month ahead for, like, map packs for Call of Duty. Like, that's where it was. That's why everybody played there. Because PlayStation would get it a month later with, you know, a month late. They'd get everything a month late. You know, zombie maps, Call of Duty maps, and all that kind of stuff. And then we saw this reverse for last generation and stuff like that. And, you know, Destiny has a lot of exclusive PlayStation content. And that's not an exclusive game to, De you know, to PlayStation. So it's, like, it's just... They're trying to hide, you know, things we've already seen, and, and it's, and I guess we really won't see how this blows back until a Bethesda game is released in I don't know seven years, um, at this point, because yeah, Starfield's not around the corner or whatever, you know, until we start seeing some of this stuff manifest. I mean, the next Bethesda real published game is a PlayStation Five exclusive. I think Deathloop comes out in May. Yeah, and, and that's the next. Bethesda game and that's not even on Xbox now so uh, who knows what this really ends up looking like I think it's just time for them to kind of stay quiet you know they should have from the get go been like listen they should have never won announced the deal because they kept talking the way they talk about it how it's like oh it's our intentions to buy it's like listen you guys already you know the time may have not hit that it's official official yet but you guys should not have talked about it because this is something that didn't leak um so uh, you guys were obviously flexing it right for the launch of Series X and S. But now you guys kind of need to stop talking about it until you actually have a game plan for these releases. Yeah, and it's interesting. If they're going to be reliant on those kind of like content exclusivity as opposed to full game exclusivity, that's kind of very interesting. Because to me at least, and I can only speak for myself, that's like the most annoying type of exclusivity is yeah. where it's like you can have the game, but certain maps are locked to certain ecosystems. And again, we're multi-platform players, so we have everything. But I, that always wasn't the case. And it would drive me nuts when like a DLC drop would be locked to a game that I have on my console. And it's like, as much as like full game you know, exclusivity could be an annoying thing. Like, listen, yeah, Mario is going to be a Nintendo game. It's on Nintendo. If you would like to play Mario, you go to Nintendo. If you like to play Halo, you go to Xbox. If you want to play Uncharted, you go to Sony. Full game exclusivity. But if there's this weird zone where, oh, you'll allow me to play the game, but this really enticing, exciting DLC is just going to be locked to me forever or maybe timed. And when it's when you're talking about these online games, for example, timing is an important thing. So if you're talking about like, hey, in six months, you'll be able to get this content drop. And it's like in six months, nobody's going to care about this game. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. So, so that's like my least favorite type of exclusivity just because it's so annoying and it's so not conducive to the way people play games where it's like, listen, if you're going to give us the game, give us the game. Don't give us some milk down, watered down version uh, of the game where you're going to lock away all the stuff we actually want to use. It's, it's just nuts. So, uh, I mean, ultimately, we'll see how people perceive this, but I feel like they're making this whole Bethesda thing a lot messier than it needs to be. For sure. They're obviously stumbling all over and, the place because no, apparently they didn't have a game plan because everyone's just talking freely. Because if this is a partnership, <clears throat> then say that. But the way, the, from what I understand, when you were messaging it, it was an acquisition. And there's a certain set of behaviors and way you go about acquisitions when co company is bought out by another company. Now that company launches its games under the banner of the parent company yep. that is financed to some degree. There's usually some kind of exclusivity that comes with it. I know Microsoft has a very different approach, but the way they're messaging it is they're they're almost like constantly downplaying it. Where it's like, well, yeah, we're, we're like working with them and there was a, a major deal in place, but we're not trying to lock their games away. We don't have any control over what they do. We're not going to make it so they can only launch on Xbox. Oh, no, we're not changing their executives. Then it's like, then what are you doing? So you gave them money for what exactly? And that's what I want to understand. Is this a partnership or is this a full acquisition? And beyond what they're calling it and what it is on paper, what is this actually going to look like? Is this going to look like, hey, we throw you guys a little bit of money uh, you give us some marketing opportunities, you give us some time to exclusivity, and then that's the extent of it. Because if, if that's what it is, then that, that's a much easier. I just communicated it, I think, more effectively than they have. Yeah, so, pretty uh, much. So, I mean, again, like we always say, ultimately time will tell um, with how this is ultimately going to play out. But again, I, I feel like it became way more of an ordeal than it really needed to be.
Yeah, I don't think it needs to be this serious. So I guess we can jump into kind of a quick story that I thought was uh, worth mentioning. And neither you or I are like major Fortnite fans or anything like that. We're not playing it every day. Um, but there is very interesting things happening in that game tech-wise. And I think it's worth mes- uh, mentioning. So Fortnite is introducing the ability to video chat with friends in-game via the Epic Games' owned social app House Party. And it's live right now. Uh, and there are really interesting tech implications here. The fact that they were able to integrate um, video chatting into a game themselves as the game publisher. This is not a hardware thing. This is not like Sony offering you know a special video chat card, for example, on the <laughs> PS5 or anything like that. Yeah. This is a video game publisher that were able to integrate video game chat into the game itself which is i mean wild to me because again there was a time there, there's games where people were like nintendo's like we can't even do video <laughs> we can't even do voice chat on our console yeah and fortnite is like we can do video chat in our game which is just i mean i just want to commend epic for what they were able to pull off here because i mean who would have known when PUBG came onto the, <laughs> to the fold and were absolutely dominated and you know epic threw their hand with their little kill the zombie game and we're going to add a little battle royale. And I mean, fast forward now, they're just industry leaders in terms of persistent online games and able to do tech things that we've never really seen before. And so this is really, really awesome. And it just excites me for the prospect because you know other companies going to try. They're going to figure out they were able to pull this off. And I would love to see other companies try this. And uh, I, I just think it would be awesome if we get other kind of online games and you know it's coming to Minecraft and stuff like that where people just mm-hmm. say, you have your little video icons on the side. But uh, first off, is this a, a even a feature that's something you would use? Um, so it all depends. So when I, I have to look at it in the aspect of Fortnite right now. And so you and I are super casual on Fortnite. We go, what, once every six months we really get in yeah. the mood to, to play. On the high end. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Depending what releases, so yeah, I, I'm really impressed with how this looks tech-wise on, on what it is. So for the people who have that crew, that this is what they do, this is what they play, to add that extra step of really connecting people in a world where we can't just set up our monitors back to back and can't even be within six feet of other people, it's nice to be able to have that sort of face-to-face communications, and it makes sense. So I I, gotta, I always give it to Epic to be the ones to really start trend setting in a, in in a way not necessarily battle royale but you know they're the ones who twisted the arms of the big three to do cross play and you know little things like that and cross saves and, and that's all really just them really moving it to the point that i it'll, at some point it'll be the norm and the big one that stuck out to me when i saw this and it was the same thing is i was like my switch can't do voice chat if i wanted to play you know if i wanted to visit your island in animal crossing we'd have to get on discord or because i'm not downloading i'm not using that nintendo app it doesn't really work that well and here they are like here if you're playing fortnite already with these people you can face chat why not i'm like that's so wild that they are able to do this when nobody was asking for this you know they're giving people things they didn't want to ask for you know i could see this in a later on like in a big you know i'm a big fighting game fan i could see that maybe making a little bit more sense uh, especially once these fighting tournaments and stuff come back and we're going to have to have like new rules on, on like how to be present and stuff like that. I don't see what would be the issue with, you know, in Street Fighter having, you know, a little cam above where Ryu's face is supposed to be, be my opponent. So, and you know, it's little things like that, that I start thinking ahead on and being like, well, that would be a nice little feature that I would use casually not necessarily as hardcore as maybe some people will. But, uh, it's definitely a feature that, you don't really, you know, you wouldn't know until it's there how well you want to use it and how much you'll want to use it. Yeah, and I actually just thought of another thing, uh, a great implication of what they can use. And it's actually another feature that Fortnite has been kind of the forerunner on, which is these in game events that they do, these concerts, these uh, seminars, these little TED Talk type situations. Uh, that I've actually been a real fan of them doing this, uh, specifically working with uh, different pol- like political analysts and stuff like that and talking about that. Um, and they have these events where you can all go and kind of watch a single screen and there's in-game audio and video of really decent quality that I was actually really surprised by. And you kind of just sit there and you watch it. And now they can make it even more of an immersive experience where you can see your friends there on the side while simultaneously hanging out with them watching a concert and stuff like that. So it looks like our prediction is really coming true that Fortnite is changing and morphing from just this this 
multiplayer battle royale game to a social hub that is including all sorts of different kind of experiences and you and i were joking around earlier when i think the podcast first started that we wouldn't be surprised if there's a time where people log into fortnite and don't even touch a game mode they just chill with their friends almost like going to some kind of virtual mall type situation where you just hang around Uh, and they yeah they added party mode or whatever it's called when is it in the party yeah i think it's party royale party Party royale 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 or something like that but you know and it's just it's very true where it's coming become a social hub because not too long ago they were like showing they did like a weekend where one night a week they were showing nolan movies like they showed batman begins and they showed inception yeah all in game and you know we were getting the star wars content before star wars released we were getting exclusive content you know and scenes shown through fortnite so it's definitely becoming way more than just a battle royale yeah, and again, I, I, I'm just excited to see what this ultimately looks like in a couple years. And the good thing for people who don't uh, really pay super, super close attention to Fortnite is that when we'll drop in, we'll just see these major upgrades. <laughs> so so next yeah. time I play Fortnite, I'm, the game is going to be probably unrecognizable to me. Uh, but I'm just excited that, like, what does this look like in five years, for example, where you probably have a whole new generation? Because, again, this is marketed to a lot of kids are on this app. So the kids that are playing now are going to, in five years, going to be a whole other set of kids. And if Fortnite's able to keep some sort of relevance in all that time, which, I mean, it's not impossible. Games like uh, Minecraft, World of Warcraft, it's been done. Um, It makes me wonder, like, what is their relationship with Fortnite going to be when Battle Royale is almost just an option for you? Like, you can play that if you want, but uh, also you can go into this mode and watch concerts and chill with your friends. And maybe they'll add more customizability and different types of things. So, Making homes and stuff. Yeah, and, and full like avatars and stuff like that. So I, I'm I'm curious, and they, again, it sounds far fetched, but look at what we're talking about now, yeah. and 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 what we what this game was just two years ago. So, I mean, when you have this kind of massive corporation like uh, Epic, the and with I mean more money than anybody, the opportunities are really endless. I mean, as long as it can work from a technical standpoint, financing is not so much of an issue. So mm-hmm. this is going to be a real interesting game to pay attention to because i feel like they're going to introduce a lot of tech things that are going to be adopted by many other game studios and uh, that's where we're going to see it used probably most creatively but the tech is probably going to pop first in fortnite and uh again neither you or i are like fortnite super fans but i think for some for people who are like into video gaming like us and paying attention to the stories it's worth keeping your eye on because they're doing some interesting things over there that are going to have implications throughout the entire industry for sure absolutely and that's something that just history's told us that that's what's going to happen 100% alright All right. moving on to the next story which is a kind of a sad one and an interesting one too though so uh, there's been a massive Capcom leak revealing tons and tons of games revealing kind of Capcom's next like four years um so capcom was uh you know subject to a sort of you know massive data breach i don't know if it was trojan or how they did it they were then being held ransom for that information capcom said they weren't going to pay so they decided to get ahead of it and release a blog post talking about listen there's going to be some stuff leaking around something's true something's not um it's not just so much like what games were released but you're talking a lot of people's like HR reports and private information who work at the industry. My thoughts go out to them because they're probably in full panic mode over there. You know, not so much that some of the work that they've been put into for so long has now kind of take the steam out because now these reveals are going to come. We're going to be like, oh yeah, I heard about that. And that sucks. But also for so much of their, you know, workers and stuff like that whose personal information is out there as well. So let's, you know, be with that. Um, but this list is everywhere, and obviously I tried to avoid it for a little bit because I, I was under the impression it was just, like, personal information, but it got posted everywhere. I started seeing a lot of things, so we're getting a lot of some project some project names, some kind of official names, um, down to the point of, like, what quarter they're going to release and what year, so it's kind of, you know, sucky. Um, there's a lot of random ones on there, but, like, some of the main ones we see, so for quarter 4, 2021, uh, Resident Evil Outbreak. We have quarter two, 2022, uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, which 
I feel like has been kind of in the whispers for a long time, especially with the re-release of Dragon's Dogma. And I think Netflix they did a show. Netflix series. Yep. I want to say just released or will Where release recently? sometime soon. Uh, Street Fighter VI for quarter three 2022, which kind of makes sense if you're looking at the, you know, pattern for it. Then you have Rockman slash Mega Man Match, which may be a project name because it kind of sounds like a mobile game, but it's the only mobile game on the list. So it's it's weird to think um, for that come quarter three 2022. Uh, one you might be, re- I know you're excited for Resident Evil 4 Remake yes. uh, for quarter four 2022. Monster Hunter 6, uh, Biohazard Apocalypse, and this is where, you know, before I get into that one, then you got, like, a Final Fight remake, a Power Stone remake, uh, Resident Evil, it's, in the, in the text and all the files, it's called Hank, I think it might supposed to be, like, Resident Evil Hunk, which is usually that big guy, so, for 2024, (laughs) you know, most of these games are, like, so far out, um, People are having main issues with the fact that so Street Fighter Six I said was quarter three twenty twenty two, uh, quarter four would be Street Super Street Fighter Six, and then a year after that Ultra Street Fighter Six, which is not surprising that they you know do the re release of the Street Fighters. I think it's kind of icky and kind of a bad practice. They have it already planned out this far ahead. I'm surprised so, they still have that. Format. I know you didn't really look too into this. I'm a huge Capcom fan, so I was really. Uh, into this information what did you think of some of these uh leaked titles well yeah i'm really really excited about a lot of these things um for i'm surprised at how many resident evil projects there are Mm -hmm. specifically um but at at the same time it doesn't surprise me because it seems like they've been full steam ahead ever since the resident evil 2 remake um when i hear like outbreak and stuff like that to me that's obviously going to be some kind of spin-off type title yeah um And so, yeah, I mean, I'm just hoping they don't, you know, empty the clip too crazy with the Resident Evil thing and get too crazy with it. Uh, I think they were able to get on a high uh, with Resident Evil 2 Remake 3. Wasn't the best thing in the world, but some people liked it, so you haven't slipped up all the way yet. Uh, Village looks awesome. And so I just hope they don't get too crazy with it and then mess it up too much. Um, Yeah, the Street Fighter 6 thing is very surprising because... I'm just surprised that they're keeping that format still. Um, mm-hmm. Back in the 90s when you couldn't like patch things and, and change things like that, that makes sense why you'd re-release the game and kind of have it. And uh, was it the most like you know player-friendly thing to do back then? I mean, not necessarily, but it was understandable that you drop a cart and what's on the cart is on the cart. So yeah. if you would like to add new characters, you got to re-release the game. And you re-release the... I mean, how many times has Street Fighter 2 came out? Like, uh, you know, come on now. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, for them to like deliberately plan three versions of the same game in such short, you know, amount of time, there's just no real need for it anymore. Um, again, easily a season two pass, a season three pass on one game. And if you want to charge people a little extra for that, that's fine. But to re-release the game in its entirety in 2020 or 2022 doesn't really make any sense anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a shame when... <laughs> Leaks are tough for these companies to deal with in general, but I mean to have like four years worth of like material yeah. leaked at once is just brutal. But uh, I mean, first off, the average player doesn't know the story exists, so most people are actually going to go unaffected. It's just probably the most people who comb through IGN articles that are going to even know about this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, man, I it, it it's a shame, but I mean, hey, that's that's the industry when you're dealing with tech. You're going to have people who are very aware and knowledgeable of how to use it, and vulnerabilities are always going to be exploited, unfortunately, and these leaks are going to happen. And this, from what I can tell, is not the, the Ubisoft leak, in, in quotes, where yeah, no. the, their games leak and you very much know it's just them putting out the information. Uh, I, I can almost guarantee that Capcom had no intention of all this information coming out in this way, and... It's a shame, but I mean, it's exciting to see that you know Capcom's going to be very active, very present, and have mm-hmm. lots of different projects that people are going to care about. Yeah, again, and it's 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 a full fledged list. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Again, unless uh, Rockman Match is code name, you know, if there is no Mega Man Twelve on here. There is no New Devil May Cry game on here. Again, this may not be a complete list. This may not be. Some of these titles may not even be you know real because there's a lot of weirdness. Because you have Biohazard Apocalypse and biohazard is just resident evil 
so is Resident Evil Outbreak and Biohazard Apocalypse the same game and that's just the other title for it. so there's a lot of weird stuff in there and unfortunately until we I will still be excited if they go and show you know Resident Evil 4 remake and whatever whatever time would be so next year's conference and stuff like that and Street Fighter 6 you know it's weird because they well it's the physical you know fiscal year 2022 but I think we haven't gotten the final battle pass or whatever the final fighters pass for Street Fighter 5 I, I think there's one more coming out um so it is a little interesting that they're that far ahead and I know some people are soured by that for Capcom is I think it's just time for them to lose the the titling of the Street Fighter games is what kind of annoys people because I only have I have the launch Street Fighter 5 but when I put it in and launch it it is whatever the new one what is ultra or whatever I did a video um, on this channel a long time ago when they did that full remake and you know you do have to buy the fighters pass but you do get upgraded to the newest version with or without having to buy you know the characters and stuff like that as long as they keep that style because let me see street fighter 6 would be for quarter 3 2022 super street fighter 6 would be quarter 4 2023 so you're looking almost a year gap how much of a re-release or upgrade will it be so it's interesting to see it sucks that it's all out there but these some of these games are going to sell regardless whether or not some of the stuff was steamed out it's not like some of that leaks like you said the ubisoft leaks which are just always someone on an airport someone took a picture over the shoulder yeah. uh, i think tomb raiders was a big one for square enix that were leaked that way and this is nowhere near what like you know sony suffered with the naughty dog leak on oh, the last yeah. of us so it's that was bad again this list could be pretty fake who knows this could be a a, a thing to just kind of Thumb down, but again, Capcom did come out and announce that they were hacked, and this, some of this information is valid. So we'll have to see what it goes. But we love Capcom; we love their games in general. So we'll still support them. Yeah, and I mean, for me at least, who's not like a fighting super fan, uh, I, I love fighting games, but I'm not the one. Who, that's more you that needs to have it day one. Yeah. Um, for Street Fighter Six, it seems like. Format-wise, my normal Street Fighter plan is probably going to be applied here too, which is I'm going to wait for years to get it and get the last iteration of it because that's always the one with all the most characters and mm -hmm. it's it's comically, it's always the cheapest version too. It'll launch for like 25, 40 bucks and have every single character, everything. And that's what I did with uh, Street Fighter 4. I got the Ultra one and uh, Street Fighter 5 for the thing. I, I have the arcade edition of Street Fighter 5 because I didn't realize they were going to drop, you know, 17 million more characters after that happened. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. it, it seems like they're still keeping up with that one. So if you're not a fighting super fan and you just kind of want to dip your toes in and see what it has to offer, waiting is probably your best thing you could possibly do because it's going to come out again and it's going to come out with more characters pre-installed for a cheaper price. So, I mean, Mortal Kombat just did that, you know. I oh yeah, they're bad too. Yeah, Mortal Kombat Aftermath was a few months ago, and now they just re-released the Ultimate Edition, which brings the other fighters, the three fighters, and everything prior to for sixty bucks. I'm glad that they did charge sixty bucks. They didn't do like a forty dollar bundle, because then that would have made me uh, feel like yeah. terrible, uh, especially since I bought Mortal Kombat from the beginning. So it's it, it's a common thing amongst fighting at this point because we had Mortal Kombat 11, Mortal Kombat 11 Aftermath. Now we have Mortal Kombat 11 Ultimate. It's kind of the get go with this. It's just speak with your wallet if that's I mean that's what you do pretty much. So yeah, and I mean that that's kind of the tough thing about specifically the fighting industry right now is in many ways it kind of punishes early adopters mm -hmm. where they get the least amount of characters off rip and pay the most money. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and that's just paid, the nature of fighting game right now. I paid 60 bucks for Street Fighter V. And then if I were to go get the Ultra, Ultra whatever, street, it's like $35. With that, you know, with everything. I'm like, come on. Yeah, it's not uncommon to have, like, you know, a, a game come out with, you know, X amount of characters and have half the roster behind a paywall at some point. Yep. Like, uh, And that's just the nature of fighting games now. Like... Is that going to change? I mean, I think it, it's very, very financially successful for them, so I seriously doubt it. Fighter Passes, I think, is probably the, the fighting game exec's favorite invention since sliced bread, probably. So, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was so popular that Nintendo even incorporated it. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, with so. Smash. So. so, I guess we can move on to the Game Awards if you want to, which yeah. is going to be our loose topic. 
um, for today. So nominees for the Game Awards have been announced. Uh, and so we're going to go through each category that I, I've listed here. And there's a ton of categories, but not all of them are worth us discussing because we don't have thoughts on, you know, esports mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and so basically we're going to discuss, like, do we think they got it right? Is there anything we think that they are missing? And from the people who are nominated, who do we want to win? So I guess we could start with the most controversial or the most, you know, well looked at uh, awards, which is the Game of the Year mm-hmm. nomination. So our nominees this year is Animal Crossing, New Horizons, you got Doom Eternal, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Ghost of Tsushima, Hades, and The Last of Us Part Two. Now, Steve, what do you think about the nominees? Who would you like to win? Is there anybody you would want added there? So this is pretty much, because I always run this through regardless. I kind of make a game of the year list. And this is pretty much the solid list. I don't see what else they would really even be missing. Um, I was even, I was, I was and wasn't surprised on Animal Crossing. I was back and forth. I'm like, oh, this pandemic f- launched that game into crazy success. Absolutely. Um, I think this is the solid list. I think these are some of the best rated games of the year and some of the games I love the most when I look back at this year. Because um, everything else right now at launch of the new gens, just, I haven't had enough time as much as I love Miles Morales. Um, I guess it missed the cutoff. I don't know what they really talk about because I think that would deserve to be on this list. I think it would knock out maybe even three of these games. Um, so that was my only semi omission where I felt they kind of left it out. But again, they're going to chalk that up into the next year's talk. So, out of this list, if I had to just, you know, pull the trigger and choose one, I would have to give it to Ghost of Tsushima. Mm. With, without a, a doubt. I, as much as I'm still playing Animal Crossing, you know, I jump in and clean up my island and stuff like that. You know, Doom Eternal have not beat since I, I mean, I've not played since I beat it. You know, I purchased it, beat it, was over. Same thing with Final Fantasy VII Remake. You know, Hades is a mix because i've been playing Hades. i didn't play really that much of Hades this year i played a lot when it like launched in alpha and all that kind of stuff i'm glad it's there don't get me wrong absolutely love it there and the last of us part two as much as i love that game and have so many like high feelings on it the lows that i feel for it, for just tank it for me whereas yeah. ghost of tsushima i'm just constantly like just raising the bar and every time i play that game i love it more last of us you know is is a little bit i had a way different experience with so what about you what did you think of this list yeah i mean their list is very similar to mine so i i don't take any major issues with mm-hmm. uh their game of the year selections um yeah nothing's missing from what i can tell as far as who i'd want to win the funny thing is i actually really like all these games uh Last of Us is probably the one that I like the least. Uh, I like that game. I do. I don't think there's a universe where it's better than literally any of the other games on these this list. Personally, that's just mm-hmm. my personal opinion. Uh, I'm. I would probably go with Ghost of Tsushima two for my winner. However, Final Fantasy VII Remake is very close for me. Like I adore that game. Uh, and once all is said and done, we get the rest of the parts and stuff like that. I feel like this saga is gonna be like some serious stuff to look at like people are gonna look back on like the seven remake saga as something one of you know gaming's better moments um and yeah i'm really actually surprised to see hades there i'm very happy that it's there yeah. uh but i'm surprised uh like an indie type game like that was able to make it with these juggernauts and actually this late too because again uh a lot of these games happen pre-july pretty much uh yeah. and this is this game popped off after that point, I mean, it started really... It, it came out way before, but uh, it started really popping kind of like in the September-October range. So to see, especially once it was released on Switch and stuff like that. So for it to be able to come in that late and be able to make it to the Game of the Year list is really awesome. It's a shame that Cyberpunk uh, missed so many of its deadlines because I feel like that changes the conversation a lot too. If uh, yeah. Cyberpunk was able to come out... And again, this is all projections. I've never played Cyberpunk. This is all just what I'm... I mean, no one's played Cyberpunk because you, it doesn't you exist. Play, you may never play Cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah, hopefully when my grandchildren get the PlayStation 13, I'll be able to, you know, give you know, 30 minutes to Cyberpunk from my old person's home. But, um, 
Yeah, if that was able to make the deadline, I feel like that changes things a lot. And that, for me, would edge out Last of Us, personally. But again, that's projections. I, I don't know if the, this game could theoretically come out and be absolutely terrible. I doubt it. But yeah. from what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I'm going with Ghost of Tsushima. But I'm honestly not mad at pretty much any of them winning. The only one I would be concerned about winning would be Last of Us Part Two because I really just don't think it's the game of the year. I don't. I think when you look at game of the year, it's the best that gaming had to offer that year, and Last of Us is not the best that ga- gaming had to offer. Now, do I think it's as bad as some people act like it is, and no. all the controversy? Absolutely not. No, I think that. I think for me personally, it's not as good or as bad as a lot of the discourse deserves. To be honest, like, all the controversy about it, like, do I think it's the best thing that gaming's ever produced? No, I think Last of Us 1 is way better than Last of Us Part 2. But I do I think it's, like, a hunk of crap, like, some people act like, no, no, it's not, it's not that bad either. I think they play around with some really cool themes, and there's some cool narrative choices there. But, uh, I'd rather play pretty much any of the other games on the year, of the games of the year list, much more. But yeah, I'm going, I'm going for Ghost of Tsushima with Final Fantasy VII in a very, very close second. What do you think will win though? Because this is this is obviously based off of uh, Jeff Keighley's game award. Yeah. You no, know, IGN does there, so we this is like the bigger one, I guess. I think I I would be. It's gonna be. It's between for me, Animal Crossing. The thing is, Last of Us Part Two is very hated by a lot of fans. However, the voting people I know are a lot of games journalists, mm-hmm. and games journalists love Last of Us Two. So, because the voting people are not necessarily just the average consumer, I could see it being between Animal Crossing and Last of Us, and I wouldn't be surprised if Last of Us edges out Animal Crossing. But I think it, it, it's one of those two. It's hard for me to say. Yeah, I feel the same. Where I, I, I think it's going to be between The Last of Us, Animal Crossing, and if there's like another one really kind of put in, and it's going to be because of nostalgic reasons, Final Fantasy VII. I think yeah, those Yeah, three, I can see that too. Um, I'm just trying to view of who I know are voting people and what their general discourse was. And we just know that games journalists, the the Kotakus, the IGNs, just have a very different view sometimes than the average voting public. So if this was like a straight vote like of people, then I think it's between, yeah, Animal Crossing. Oh, Animal Crossing would take it. Yeah, Animal Crossing just dominates. Uh, But because games journalists, I know that specifically narrative experience resonate with them at a higher rate than the average person, then that's why I think Last of Us might win. And if Last of Us might, if Last of Us wins, I'm probably more scared than the election results, to be honest with you. (laughs) Like, Mm. the fallout from that's going to be rough. Yeah, Twitter will be a, a nice cesspool to read that night. So I guess we can move on to the next one now, which is Best Game Direction, which is Final Fantasy VII Remake, Ghost of Tsushima, Hades, Half-Life Alex, uh, which is a VR game, I believe, and Last of Us Part Two. For me, just throwing it out there, game direction, I'm cool with all these choices. Ghost of Tsushima has to take it because this is, to me, the most cinematic experience I've probably ever had in a game before. So, and that's what I'm assuming they're talking about in terms of game direction. So that's what I'm going with. Uh, but uh, what what's your thoughts on this category? Yeah, it it would be the same. Where I would uh, be, I would I'd have to give it to Ghost of Tsushima as well, just because in any way you look at it, where like how the game continues, how the game rolls on from moment to moment, to the narration, to the story, to just how it really implements the new, like you know, no having not to check your map so much, you following the wind, little things like that. Um, it really again depends how some this is so full of interpretation um because you know final fantasy 7 at the end is kind of just a steampunk uh semi you know steampunk uh, aesthetic and that story is something we already know um hades i think would be maybe another good choice for this just because everything about that game is fantastic especially from style story you know the way it progresses as well uh, half-life alex i think will suffer from the fact that it's locked to oculus i think and The Last of Us is, you know, again, we've already nudged into that one. So I would I would probably give it to Ghost of Tsushima as well. I think maybe them, Ghost or Hades, will take it. Yeah, probably. I think, and, all, and I'm really surprised, Hades is actually nominated for a lot of things. So it's going to take one of these. I'd be really surprised if it doesn't win one category. It's yeah. just hard to tell which one it's going to win. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I now that and not to backtrack, I think it would be awesome if Hades won Game of the Year, and it would just throw the entire industry for a loop. Just this mm-hmm. team, this indie game, just dominate over the other ones. I think that would be awesome. Uh, but yeah, so I guess we can move on to best narrative now. Uh, Thirteen Sentinels, Aegis Rim. I'm actually not familiar with that. I guess written by George uh, Kamatini or Kamatani. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake, you got Katsushige Nojima, Motomi Toriyama, Hiroki Iwaki, and Sachie Hirano. You have Ghost of Tsushima by Ian Ryan, Liz Albel, Patrick Downs, and Jordan Lemos. Hades by Greg Kasavin, and then Last of Us Part Two by Neil Druckmann and Haley Gross. Uh, so what are you feeling for narrative? So this is strictly story-based. Who do you think should win? And yeah. Um, I'd have to for out of this list, so Thirteen Sentinels. I know nothing about. I know yeah, that it it goes on sale constantly <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> on Amazon and um, Warrior sixty four is constantly tweeting about this game. I didn't. I don't know what it even is. I would have to, and, and this one was actually kind of hard when I was looking at this last night because as much as I love Ghost, the story is not like the strongest strongest point. It's good, yeah, but it's not maybe the greatest. Um, and then Hades, I was like, kind of, I was debating in Hades where I'm like, oh, but it's, I just, there's some, the way it's told is what would probably hurt its narrative um, for most people. I would actually have to give this to Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, Same. The, the way, just the way that they were able to take a story we knew. They took a, I want to say, three to four hour section from the original game and flush it out to beyond a reimagining. You know, it's beyond a remake, which is why I think calling it Final Fantasy VII Remake is such a disservice, because it's re- way more than that. Yeah. But the fact that you took the littlest things and made me care about them and really expanded them and made me so hopeful and excited to try, you know, continue, you know, what the rest of the parts are going to be, um, I'd have to give it to that. I think that they told the story the best. They helped develop the characters the best. Um, you know, The Last of Us Part Two was good character-wise. I think the story, the main story is what kind of lost it for me but and then but you know character wise they really nailed it but i gotta think as overall packaged you know i mean final fantasy had it from barrett to tifa to yeah you know everyone except cloud cloud is actually my least favorite character in the game (laughs) just because he's kind of a jerk um but that's who i'd have to give it to yeah for me i'm going with seven remake as well uh again and i think it does have a little bit of a unfair advantage of the fact that again we knew this story so we got to see all the awesome narrative choices that they made to contextualize a lot of the stuff especially the fact that we're only getting a segment of the story but just some of the contextualization and some of the writing specifically uh with a lot of the side content and all the the submissions you do i just think it's just a fantastically written story ghost of tsushima has an excellent story as well uh but to me it's not doing anything necessarily that we haven't seen from literally any of the other uh major samurai films that inspired it Mm -hmm. so it's it's obviously hearkening back to a particular aesthetic and narrative style but it's not necessarily reinventing or doing something new for that hades for me it's the characters that really take it to the next level for me not so much just the story in and of itself um and yeah it does have an unconventional story style and in the way it tells its narrative because again you're you're playing in runs you're dying you're coming back and it's kind of dripping you different aspects of the story and depending on how far you make it you'll get you know more more characters around and more story uh relating to them so it's an unconventional way that they tell the narrative in there but again for me it's the characters that make it great last of us part two has a great narrative i think it's well written uh but again it's not something that particularly resonated it's not something that really sat with me uh, I didn't get lost in, 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 in a good way, like completely dived into like like I did with 7 Remake, where it's just like I was enraptured by that story. And it's crazy because, again, I know that story already. And the fact that they were able to grip me like that, again, is just a testament to the writing where Last of Us Part Two I think, had a very interesting story. But I think what makes it more interesting is more of the themes they're playing around with rather than some of the narrative choices they make, if that mm-hmm. makes any sense. Absolutely. So I guess we can move on to one that I'm actually really excited to talk about, which is Best Performance. Uh, We have Ashley Johnson as Ellie. We have Laura Bailey as Abby. Daisuke Suji as Jin Sakai. Logan Cunningham as Hades. And Najee Jeter as Miles Morales. Now, uh, we have a lot of heavy hitters here. What do you think? Who, Who would you go for? 
Mr. Jeter as Miles Morales. Yeah, I like that. Um, don't get me wrong. Laura Bailey is great. Uh, she's in. She's kind of becoming like Troy Baker, where he's just in everything. Um, I have crazy respect for her. I have crazy respect for Ashley Johnson. Their performances as these characters were great. Um, Ashley Johnson, the thing is, we saw this already. You know, we, we, she, yeah. don't get me wrong. She did great as Ellie. She did great as an older Ellie. Not so much new to Ellie. We see obviously this darker Ellie, and she knocked it out of the park. That's fine. Um, Laura Bailey, I think, again, did great as Abby. Um, I just think the way Abby was written was a little um, weird for certain um, aspects. And um, Daisuke as as Jin Sakai was great as well. But again, the overall story and all that kind of stuff didn't let him shine, maybe, as much as I would say. Um, And then, um, so to me, I have to give this to, to Miles. As, you know, we've already seen miles in certain media in different aspects from different animated spider-man shows to obviously the biggest culturally one i I would guess would be spider-verse is what people compare to um for him to you know incorporate you know we saw a little bit of him in spider-man 2018 but to take the whole performance and really give enough like enough of respect to all these other versions of miles we saw but also to really encapture it and make it his own so respectfully, I have to give it to him because this is not an easy thing to do to take an icon who's you know becoming a culture icon in, in so many ways, do it again in a certain aspect and nail it. And I think he completely nailed it. And I can't wait. Where, you know, if I don't ever get another Last of Us game, I'm fine. You know, if I never have to see an Ellie and them again, that's great. If Ghost of Tsushima wasn't getting a sequel, <laughs> well, we know if it's getting a sequel. But if it wasn't, you know, in Hades, we won't really get a Hades too, I doubt the way they make games where I can't wait to see more of his miles. So I have to give it to that one. Yeah. I mean, this one was tough for me too. Yeah. Uh, I loved Ashley Johnson's Ellie. I've always loved her as Ellie. Uh, But again, yeah, we've seen this before too. So though I I think it's worth commending her, I don't necessarily feel like she, she deserves the award necessarily over some of the other new iterations of characters. Laura Bailey as Abby was fine to me. I think all the performances are excellent in Last of Us, but again, it's not something that really stood out to me. Uh, Daisuke Suji as Jin Sakai. Again, loved his performance here. We've already kind of spoke about that. Now now we're getting into these two that is a little bit tougher. So I loved Logan Cunningham as Hades. I mean, just yeah. the guttural, dark voice. Like, boy. Like, I love it. He's just, oh, are you still trying? Like, I love it. He's excellent. Um, and then Najee Jeter, yeah, I mean, I think he did a fantastic job of not only some of just the emotion behind some of the the line delivery in Miles Morales, especially in the late game. Uh, and I won't go deeper than that because, again, some people haven't played it, but uh, some of the more emotional moments, I think, just really stand out to me. Uh, and I think he also did a great job of really getting the voice right considering the age of Miles. I think he's around 17 at this point. Mm-hmm. And I think he did an excellent job there. And I don't know how old Naji Jeter is. So if he's younger, beautiful, then it, it's perfect. But if not, I think he did a great job actually depicting someone. Because every once in a while, you'll, you'll play these games and they'll have someone who's supposedly a high schooler, like Ichigo from like Bleach. And dude has just a whole man voice. And it's like, yeah. what is going on? Uh, so I think he did a great job in that regard. So it's really, really close for me. Um, I'm probably actually going to go with Logan Cunningham as Hades for me. Okay. And it's really tough. Again, Miles Morales is one of my favorite games of the year, period. But if we're just talking performance versus performance, and I got to take my bias out of the way for, like, I love Miles Morales as a character, period, more than anybody. But just a performance, I got to go with Log- Logan Cunningham because I just think a lot of the Hades vocal performances are next level for me. Oh, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that, if I had to get a second choice, I'd go to Hades. I'd go for Logan Cunningham as well. So we can move on to Best Indie now. We have Carrion by Phobia Game Studio. Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout by Media Tonic and Devolver. Hades by Supergiant. Spelunky 2 by Mossmouth. And Spiritfarer by uh, Thunder Lotus Games. Now these are all excellent games. I've played every single one except for Carrion. I am aware of what Carrion is. I've watched the trailer uh, for it on YouTube before we recorded the show. Looks excellent. I actually realized I had seen this on uh, Steam before. And I almost bought it one day because it... I'm a sucker for that whole, like, looking of, like, the new pixelized, uh, what do you call it, like, um, 
Metroidvania type game, and it has that kind of flair that I feel like we got from like Axiom Verge, for example, where it's like old 8 16 bit look but with a lot of newer effects and stuff like that and i saw a lot of cool like ambient lighting and stuff like that we're carrying and stuff like that but i'm not familiar enough with it to actually like render a verdict to say like it's the best indie game for me mm-hmm. uh for me i gotta i mean very obviously gotta go with hades for me personally of super giant games uh because again that's one of the best games of the year period let alone once you narrow it to the indies forget about it uh but again these all these games are excellent for what i understand yeah, all these games are fun, you know, and, and they're right in their <clears> specific, um, you know, in their specific style. But, I mean, it's Hades, Supergiant games. Supergiant's Hades is just, hands down, I have to give it to them. I, I played some of these other games. Obviously, Fall Guy is probably the most carry, carrying I watched. I initially heard about this because of its Switch icon and the whole story behind that. Then I did actually see gameplay. Uh, my brother did get the game. Okay. And it's 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 I'm like okay I see it don't get me wrong I do see it there I, I do like that Spelunky's never been it's never been my thing um mm-hmm. so Spitfire is really the only one I haven't really touched but I think Hades is just on another level you know Hades is at that point where it's almost it shouldn't even be considered an indie game obviously it's from an indie developer but the the quality and everything that's there is just nice. leaps and leaps and I mean I've been preaching about this game for a, a long time now so. Yeah, but and I but I do got to give a shout. Out. Yeah, Fall Guys is like I mean so fun. So they're they're a close second for me personally. But uh, yeah, now nah, Hades, come on now, stop it. So the next one, best role playing, we got Final Fantasy VII Remake by Square Enix. We have Genshin Impact MiHoYo, uh, Persona Five Royal Atlas P Studios. We have Wasteland Three In Exile Entertainment and Coke, and then Yakuza Like a Dragon, uh, Ryu Got Kotoku Studio Sega. What a name. Mm -hmm. Alright, so for (laughs) best role playing, um, I think, so for me, for me I gotta go with Final Fantasy VII Remake, I haven't played Yakuza yet, Wasteland 3 I have played, wasn't my thing, Uh, 5 Royal I haven't played unfortunately, I've only gotten to play the regular Persona 5, so I wouldn't be mad if that wins, Uh, and then Genshin Impact I have played, again not really my thing, Uh, in terms of which one's gonna win, I mean I'd be surprised if anything but Genshin Impact wins. Just because, again, that's just <laughs> dominating right now. Like, yeah, dominating. The market is... And it has, a, I think, the one advantage over the other two where it's it's just global. It's just the international implications of it. Like, specifically with, the, like, everywhere. China. Like, I mean, just Korea. Like, the, these, this game is massive worldwide. As opposed to 7 Remake, which I know is... It, again, Final Fantasy is, is known worldwide. But again, the United States, Japan are like the big places pushing it. Same thing with Persona 5 Royal. Um, I'm surprised Yakuza actually made the cut. Because again, that, I think that came out on like, what, November 10th? Something like that? Yeah, so, it was cutting it, it close. considered a quote-unquote... It's because it's... I don't know, because it came out last year in Japan? Or it may have came out this year in Japan. And so maybe that gave uh, it yeah. a... It's been out for some time in Japan, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah... For the fact that so I played a little bit of Genshin Impact, I'm I don't consider a role playing game, um, because I don't consider Breath of the Wild a role playing game. So that's not uh, for my choice. Uh, my choice, I would have to give it to um, Final Fantasy VII again, um, just because don't get me wrong, I do have Persona Five Royale and stuff like that, and though they did a lot of um, you know cleaning up and some just making things make sense a little bit better in the game, it's still just Persona Five. Um, which is excellent. You know, which is excellent. Don't get me wrong, but I just don't. Th- I think where Final Fantasy VII Remake is like a new game, Persona Five is definitely just a reworked, um, in a sense. So, and uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon, I probably it, that would probably be my vote. I have not. I ordered this on Amazon. Amazon lost the package, so they had to credit oh, really? back to me. So I have not oh, had a chance terrible. to play. Um, I've tried to get Yakuza about three times now. For some reason, it's, it's the world is not game. <laughs> Yeah, some reason there's not, and I just gave up. Now I'm just gonna get it digital because I'm playing myself. Um, that would probably be my. From what I've seen, that probably would be my choice if I got my hands on it. I also think that it should probably be considered for next year because of such a late release. But yeah, me too. I will. Pro- it will probably. End up, it'll probably. I'd give it to Final Fantasy. It'll probably be Genshin Impact just because yeah, the cultural hit it's been. It's free. It's on mobile. It's on. Not on Switch yet, I don't think. But I think it's um, coming though. It is coming, you know, but it's on PC, it's on PlayStation, um, so it's 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 got all the mechanics to hook people. Free to play, it's got the gotcha mechanic, so and all these little microtransactions. It 
it's it's and it's funny too because like I'm I'm still looking at the role playing and it's tough because again yeah I haven't played five royals so I can't technically vote for it, but the thing is Persona Five is probably my fa- favorite RPG period of last gen, so yeah. it's like one of those things where it's like do I think Final Fantasy Seven remake is better than Persona Five? No, not necessarily, but I can't vote for Persona Five Royal because I haven't played it and I don't know what they added to it to be honest. Like and I know it didn't make the game worse, but I can't necessarily say that. 100 percent because again mm-hmm. i haven't played it so i it's like almost like i have to nullify my vote but uh and go by seven remake um by default but again things be very different if i actually played royal so i guess we could jump into the last segment this is definitely gonna oh wait no second to last sorry sorry yep. uh this one's gonna be definitely big for you so best fighting game grand blue F- fantasy versus arc system works uh we got mortal kombat 11 ultimate we got nether realm there Street Fighter Five Championship Edition, Capcom and Dimps, uh, One Punch Man, a hero nobody knows. Very surprised to see that there. Uh, mm-hmm. Spike Chunsoft, Bandai Namco, which I didn't know Spike Chunsoft make that. Look at them, Dang and Rumpel guys. Uh, and then Under Night in Birth, EXE Late C what CL Dash R, which is French Bread and Arc System Works. Yeah. <laughs> what what is that name? I thought Kingdom Hearts was bad. Yeah, no, they they got nothing on Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> this one's nuts. So. Um, you know about these games a lot more than I do. Um, uh, these Arc System Works games, I don't know too... I can't really differentiate between them too much. So Under Night, mm-hmm. to me, looks exactly like um, Grand Blue Fantasy, which looks exactly, to me, kind of like Guilty Gear. So they all kind of look the same to me. So yeah. I can't speak on the differences. What do you think about mm-hmm. this, this segment? All right, so I think it's a very weird one because, you know, Under Night and street fighter and mortal kombat are none of those games released this year you're you're playing upgraded versions um this year okay because mortal kombat 11 was two years ago almost now i want to say or a year ago uh street fighter this is just the newest upgrade you know to it same with that and so so is under because it's under night in birth and then there's under night in birth ex under night in birth ex late and now it's under night in birth <laughs> ex late parentheses cl dash r so these th- those three it's a weird list because three of these guys are games that have been around for about three or four years now okay so it's interesting i have not i've played everything on here except one punch man oh um and right. that i'll be honest i, I this is not sh- the game's not that good um okay. from what i've seen um i i i've seen the mechanic and it just looks like an old cash and anime this is not coming to evo this is not coming to i'm surprised that game's on the list i don't know if they were just short on it um grand blue fantasy it just is just a, a simpler guilty year i'll be honest okay. so it is there and so when i look at the whole list and under night in birth is kind of in the same category where it's just like a very anime weebish you know anime fighting game with no real story there is no yeah, real story I played story one of it. those with the yeah. ruby girls I don't know which one's that but yep so I have to give I would have to give it to Mortal Kombat um, just because of how fun that game is how iconic that game has been able to continue it on and keep it you know fresh with these new um, characters and stuff like that Street Fighter makes it a little bit more difficult to try to get some of these characters and it's really microtransaction and that's been my issue with Street Fighter 5 for a long time um, again, One Punch Man, I just don't understand how it got on this list. Um, if I had to choose... So my personal choice is Mortal Kombat, just because it's the newer one in my mind still that, I, I, that I'm continuing playing. Like, I installed it on PS5 and stuff like that. Street Fighter, I just thought it was kind of over. That Like, I'm, I'm surprised that... I don't know, it's, it's confusing because Tekken 7 just released a new season but Tekken 7 is not rebranding itself it's still Tekken 7 it's not Tekken 7 EX or anything like that so I'm surprised that that's sh- you know that should be on the list too if I had to give it st- I don't even know who I would assume would get it I guess Grand Blue Fantasy because that's really popular um in Japan they're really trying to make it over here um okay. I know the anime's here I know we're getting a mobile game there's rumors that a Grand Blue character is coming to Smash that's been a big thing so I okay. guess I'd have to give it to them for being a little bit more unique. I would almost give it, it as a, th- I think, Soul Calibur, but like 2D style, I guess is the best way to try to... Got you. F- 
frame that. So I would probably, I I probably would assume Grand Blue might take it. All right, yeah, and I'll withhold my vote because I honestly, <laughs> I honestly don't feel qualified enough to speak on this. <laughs> just yeah, to be fair, with this you. one's a really rough, rough list. It's really weird because I think Mortal Kombat won fighting game last year. Okay, and it was Mortal Kombat 11, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't know. So, I, so I don't. It's, it's, fighting it's a hard make sense. list. It's a hard list because it's mostly including uh, re-release. It's just so, that that whole fighting game industry is just structured so differently than a lot of the other game industries. So mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. with the re-releases and the fighter packs and what year does it? It's like almost like you almost have to treat them kind of like the persistent online games where they're like a platform that doesn't go anywhere, yeah. and you just have to almost rate them by their updates. But some do it and some don't. Like for example, with Tekken. So I don't know. Yeah, Tekken, Dragon Ball Fighters uh, really did a uh, complete rework where they added assisting, and you can choose what assist attacks and stuff like that. But again, they did not rebrand, so that did, did that disclose, you know, did that dis like discount them from this? So it's a hard list. I have a lot of issues with it, yeah. but I mean, it's the list we got. So best score in music, uh, we got Doom Eternal, Mick Gordon. The winner. I'm just going to stop right there. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Nobuo Uematsu, who's an absolute legend. Masashi Hama- Hamauzu. Sorry if I'm butchering your name. And Mitsuto Suzuki. We have Hades with Darren Korb. Ori and the Will of the Wisp with Gareth Coker. And uh, The Last of Us Part Two. Gustavo Santaolala and uh, Mac Quale. So for me, I'm going Doom Eternal. However... And it's for me, it's Doom Eternal by an incredibly large margin. Uh, and the funny thing is, Doom Eternal soundtrack. I actually think Doom One's soundtrack is better than Doom Eternal, but it's still so good that it still puts it in first place for me, which tells you how much I hold <laughs> Doom in, in that high regard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I will give a some credit to Last of Us Part Two just because I really love that acoustic style, like country folk vibe that they have that it's like dark and menacing but at the same time it captures a lot of that kind of like pacific northwest folk vibe to it and i just think it's really really excellent i like it too but it's way more low-key it, it, it's not something that i think a lot of people have played through last of us part two and it's like oh my god did you hear that song mm-hmm. to be honest what I'd put for this year's best soundtrack for me is not on this list. It's Miles Morales, but I'm not going to do that to them. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and again, I'm biased. I love, you know, hip-hop music. And I love metal, too. So that's why uh, Doom Eternal is second for me. Um, but I also did love uh, Seven Remakes music as well. But again, it's kind of like reworked music from the original, uh, yeah, which I also love. Issue. Hades, to be honest, I, I like Hades music a lot, but it's not something that I've actually really noticed like at, to a deep amount. There's so much that I'd like, for example, seek out the soundtrack or anything like that. Uh, fun while I'm playing, but that's kind of the beginning and the end of it. And then Ori and the Will of the Wisps. I haven't played enough of that game to, to judge it, to be honest. I've only played, I mean, maybe half an hour of that game. So I, I can't say definitively. So uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, so uh, this one was a hard one, you know, because thematically, I think um, Gustavo Santala is can nail he can nail the aesthetic and the theme of what The Last of Us is. So he really, so he's got it's great there. I'll be honest, I've not played Ori and Will and the Wisp yet. I okay, just so I can't really say too much. Hades from my thing with Hades is I remember enjoying. I remember kind of bobbing my head to the beats. I could not recite or whistle or hum any of the music to you. Right yeah, now. me neither. So yeah. it shows how that standing. I'm in the same boat where I'm like, man, Final Fantasy VII has a good soundtrack, but they are almost remixes of the original. So besides some of the hooks and stuff like that, it's like kind of yeah reworked music. So I ha- I have to give it to Doom Eternal um, with Mick Gordon just for the fact that I still can hear some of those guitar riffs, and it's been a little bit since I've played Doom Eternal, but I can still like recall you know when i'm bashing someone's head in or shooting with a shotgun and you can hear and i'm doing all my jumping around and i hear that soundtrack play up it's it's just fantastic you know i i i kept bouncing back last night when i looked at the list between because between the last of us and doom eternal where i really do like this super almost country um acoustic kind of style um that gustavo brings to the last of us and and i you know just and that just brings me back to that, especially when you're on the home screen, like The Last of Us, and you hear the guitar just kind of clicking away. 
but those moment to moment gameplay that are just so enha- enhanced by Doom Eternal soundtrack by McGordon just is what helped push me over the edge because that enhances it just right there to the point where it's like man I kind of want to play the game again just so I can hear that I still have it installed I think but uh, just so I yeah, can hear too. it well it's on Game Pass anyway so I'm good yeah. to go um, so that's why I have to give this Doom Eternal just above um, The Last of Us Part 2 just because I'm such a fan of uh, the um, Gustavo and Mac uh, that do the soundtrack for them well and that's a crazy thing is Doom Eternal I'm going with as number one uh, and that's funny because it's actually winning for me with kind of a screwed up soundtrack too because I don't remember I don't, I'm assuming you remember the controversy yeah we uh, talked about uh, it here on the show yeah it was a whole mess with this and mm-hmm. uh, there was a lot of mixing issues and quality issues and there was like two different people who actually worked on it so it's interesting that they're only really crediting uh, Mick Gordon here too which I mean no, nothing wrong with that I, from what I understand he did a bulk of the work he just didn't finish it um and so that's just crazy where like doom eternal with it with its messed up soundtrack still is number one which is crazy (laughs) which is absolutely crazy but i mean it's just so 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 good and even for people who maybe are not into uh metal music the most you could even i mean just admit that like that energy that it brings and the way it syncs up so beautifully to the gameplay and it just matches the aesthetic perfectly i mean it's just phenomenal uh now who do you think is gonna win i think in previous years, we've seen Doom win because they he brought the guy out to perform. From what I understand, at the Game Awards, uh, Mick Gordon actually did a performance. Yeah, when yeah. He... I I don't. It's interesting because we don't know what. The I could see was. Last of Us winning. I can I don't again. Know. I can see Last of Us winning because I think they won one year um, for the soundtrack. Duh, rightfully so. Yeah. I wouldn't be too mad of any of these things winning. Ori is really big. Again, I don't have a huge connection to it because I haven't had the time to play either either of the games. But I know that has a following like crazy. So I, I could see them maybe taking it too. It's, it's an interesting where I'm not necessarily mad for any of these taking um taking the win. I'd be maybe shocked if Final Fantasy VII took it. I'd be shocked a little bit if Hades took it. Yeah. But any of the other three, I can see them taking it without an issue. Yeah, I'm not mad at that if uh, any of these uh, take it. But... Uh, from what I understand, the Game Awards is on, what, December 10th, if I'm not mistaken? Yes. So so look out for that, and uh, once that actually happens, towards the end of the year, we'll be doing kind of our like you know year-end wrap-up shows and stuff like that, going from uh, around the holidays, we'll probably have like you know a holiday-ish show, and then early in the year, we can do our final, like once 2020 or it is completely wrapped up we'll do our kind of year-end wrap-up and that'll probably include some game award stuff and what we thought about that uh towards that point uh and the good thing for us is we don't have to have a cutoff so we can have the hard like what our 2020 games of the year if you came out in december 31st 2020 you, you count as a 2020 game so yeah, uh I'm, and and we'll be able to bring cyberpunk gotta, into all these we gotta things. bring cyberpunk into the mix uh yep. maybe i'll get my yakuza by then or maybe i'll play yakuza uh, like a dragon by then you know miles is gonna be a big contender for you and i and oh yeah definitely so it's gonna be interesting yeah maybe we'll do our own little game awards the neo vintage game awards yeah you heard it here first yeah. i think that's a good idea actually we should look into that we um, january episode yeah absolutely and uh yeah, I mean, Cyberpunk's not coming. I, I was going to say, I was like, oh, I just can't wait to play Cyberpunk. It's, I'll believe it when Cyberpunk I see it. Cyberpunk the day of the Game Awards? Aren't they both December 10th? Uh, yeah, they're both December 10th. So If, if it launched, I don't think yeah. it's launching. And I know once I beat Call of Duty, I'm jumping into Yakuza. So we're going to have a lot more contenders in our Game Awards that we'll be able to throw in there. And uh, I'll be able to throw throw in my Oldman games, Castlevania. <laughs> or, or Bloodstained, rather. A Curse of the Bloods- Moon too. I'll be able to Curse jump up, throw my old games in. I love that but, uh, game, man, so that may be up there. It's excellent, right? Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm throwing that in there. We're, we're going to do, like, best 8-bit games or something like that, and that's when I can talk <laughs> about, like, I can fall. I can yeah. fall and stuff like I that. I can fall, too. I have not gotten to. I have it on my Series X. I have not. Bro, I'm, I'm not telling you. I have not Bro. gotten into it yet. All right. So, till next time, this is the New Vintage Podcast. I am Jabril, and I am with... Steve, hope you guys enjoyed. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Take care. <laughs>